From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. Today we're going to be talking about the intersection of dryland rice farming and racial healing in the American South. That's right after these brief announcements. This program is sponsored by Shine, a pet food company that features over 40 organic, fresh dog and cat food recipes that give your animals delicious and balanced meals. Shine uses responsibly sourced ingredients and earth-friendly packaging, and they're a certified B corporation, which means that they meet the highest social and environmental standards. My own dogs eat Shine pet food, and they love it, even my very finicky dog, Curly. Shine has stores in Santa Fe, Boulder, and Denver, and you can order online from anywhere at shine.pet. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released sixth edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. I'd like now to welcome Conda Mason. She is co-founder and president of Jubilee Justice, jubileejustice.org. Welcome to Down to Earth. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Jubilee Justice is a nonprofit dedicated to a lot of great things like racial justice, regenerative farming, cooperative practices, and healing. Tell us about this organization. Like, how did it get started? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting question because I, we have two programs. And the program that you're most familiar with and that your audience is familiar with is the one that has to do with working with black farmers. But there was a program before that. And that program had to do what we call Jubilee Justice Journeys, and that was working with people in general around the issues that confront America in places where most oppression comes, uh, where people are most vulnerable. And that is the, I look at it as the pillars, four pillars are land, race, money, and spirit. And so Jubilee Justice was founded by a chance meeting with myself and a woman named Elizabeth Keller, whose family owns a legacy plantation in Louisiana, in Alexandria, Louisiana, where I actually live now, who, who'd have thought back then. When we met, she was very pained by the legacy of enslaved people on this land that her family owns, and they became owners of it in 1927. But she always wanted as a 3,600-acre plantation turned into the largest organic farm in the state of Louisiana. But she's pained by the legacy of slavery and wanted healing to be done here. And so it really started with me bringing together groups of people. We came here once and did an incredible journey of about 35 people, black and white, coming together to deal with the issues of land, race, and money and their origins of this country being founded around those really difficult issues. And so that's how it actually got started. And in the second journey that we had here on the land, I met a black woman who was working with farmers and helping them save their land, and she's a lawyer. And she gave us so much, the group, so much information about the current status of black farmers in America and how difficult it is, 30,000 acres a year being taken from black farmers. The fact that black folks after emancipation and in the early 1920s in the census that they managed to aggregate over 20 million acres. And it is now down to less than 2 million acres. And the systemic nature of what happened 
and what continues to happen. And so through that encounter, through the Journeys program, then right after that, I ran into a dear friend of mine who owns a company called Lotus Foods. And Lotus Foods has most beautiful rice, I think, on the shelves right now. They're a rice company that has organic, and now they're actually regenerative organic. They're the first regenerative organic certified rice company in the world. And I ran into Carol, who owns that company, and she started talking about the system of rice intensification and how it's good for the land and it's regenerative. Uh, you know, so everything about you know methane, the capturing of not releasing the methane that typical rice production does with all the water, and then how also it was more abundant for the farmer as well. And that is just this, this incredible crop to grow this way in the system of rice intensification, SRI. And so she was telling me that, and I was just listening, and then she said that she wanted to create a domestic supply chain of rice growers here in the U.S., because all of her rice was coming from Asia and Africa. And the first thing out of my mouth was after talking to Jillian and hearing about the plight of the black farmers and knowing that I come from also a very small farming family, the first thing out of my mouth was, what about black farmers? What if you created a cohort of black farmers who were your supply chain in America? And she thought, well, that's a great idea. And the next thing I knew, I was on a Zoom call and Jubilee Justice had this Black Rice Farmers Project in collaboration with Cornell University, who are the people who have been promoting a system of rice intensification around the world the most. And a woman named Erica Steiger is my deep partner in this project, who is at Cornell, a man named Mark Fulford as well. And then so I had the technical assistance from Cornell. I had the market from Lotus Foods. And we just had to create the product and find the black farmers and make it happen. And so that is how it began. Let's talk a little bit more about the system of rice intensification. This is a dry land system as opposed to wetland rice farming. What does it look like? I mean, what's going on on the ground? Well, here's the thing is that rice is a grass Rice can tolerate water, but it does not love water. No plant really does well with their roots submerged under water full time because the oxygen can't get to, it still needs oxygen just like other plant roots do. So what we have with the classically grown rice is a rice whose growth has been stunted. It's never its full expression. And so the only reason why the water is there is just to suppress weeds. Now, that is not a small feat. Suppressing weeds is really important. But that's the only reason for it, is to suppress weeds. So if you get rid of the water, what you have now is a plant. That's only one principle of SRI. The other has to do with giving the plant more room for the roots to spread. So we do this this spacing of about a foot between plants. And typically, rice is like planted right next to each other. It's submerged in water. And also, the seedlings are older when they put them in the ground because they they also need to be tall to to sustain the water. The way that we plant it with SRI is that the seedlings are about two to three weeks old. So they've got their whole life in front of them. We plant them 12 inches apart. We don't submerge them with water. And the plant is huge compared to the size of a plant that is not grown that way. So in growing rice, they call it tillers, and that the tillers are the the stems or the leaves. And in a typical way of growing rice, you may have about an average of 12 tillers per plant. In the SRI method, average is 35 tillers, and we go up to 100, 150 in one plant, one seed. So the plants are happier, they're bigger, they're more abundant. And it also, because of the way that we plant it with such spacing, the pounds per acre is significantly down, meaning that in a traditional way of growing rice, you are usually about seven, between 75 to 85 pounds of rice per acre, 
we use about six to eight pounds of rice per acre. That is an incredible savings for the, for the farmer. When you say use pounds of rice per acre, what does that mean? We plant, sorry, we plant. Okay. So how do you deal with weeds? So that's a really, that's the question of the hour. Because we're, we're organic and we're not, you know, using any kind of herbicides or anything. So the weed issue is a big issue. We have done several different things. One is in an ideal plantings, what we would have is grow cover crops with a lot of biomass, terminate the cover crops, and do a direct planting directly into the cover crop, and the cover crop being a live mulch. We here, where I am on this land, have not been able to grow the massive cover crops in the winter. Our biomass has been smaller, but our summer is good. We have a very high water table, and so cover crops, again, their roots are submerged in water the whole winter, and so they don't grow as tall as we would like them to. And we do a big diversity of cover crops, um, you know, rye being the, the tallest one, the one with the most biomass that we hope for. But right now, for example, we have the cover crop of sun hemp, and it's growing massively tall, but it's also not that time of the year. We have instead used hay. We've used hay, and hay has its drawbacks in terms of cost, in terms of labor. There's a lot to it. So we're, what we're trying to do, we've been doing this on a very small scale. We're trying to figure out how to scale this operation. Essentially, the way we've been doing it up until this year, we have been kind of the small scale hand planting operation. In order for this, for us to actually get more rice and to be in the market, we wanted to scale it up by a couple of acres even, and it makes it much harder to do weeding and everything by hand. So we have now moved into mechanization, and we are working with different companies to figure out the best way to do a no-till to low-till, whether it's direct seeding, whether it's transplants, how to cultivate and harvest the crop. So we're still working on all of that. But we did a trial last year where we had a no-till. We had cover crops out in the field. We terminated the cover crops. We put down a nice vermicompost. Then on top of that, we did a very thick layer of hay, and we hand-transplanted seedlings into that hay, and it worked very well, where we had to weed once, maybe, I think, throughout the summer. It worked very well. And we had a very dry summer, which was great. And the mulch layer of hay was able to keep the soil moist enough for the rice. And the rice really, it was thriving. But it was a lot of labor doing hand labor into thick mulch for, it was a quarter of an acre. But we had a very good yield. But hay is also... In order to do, you know, acres, it's, it's not really that feasible unless we grow our own. So that's what we're looking at now is really creating our own hay because of seeds and, as well and, you know, all the kinds of things that can happen with hay that you're getting. And so our ideal is a live mulch, our own cover crop mulch to plant directly into. And so that's what we are working with now. That's our trial. You're listening to Down to Earth. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're in a new chapter of conservation. In the first chapter of conservation in this country, you had wilderness and then you had city. But today, more and more, we understand that there's this very important piece in the middle that we call the working landscape. That is Leslie Allison, the executive director of the Western Landowners Alliance. These are the places that provide our food, our fiber. They provide the jobs that sustain the rural communities. These things are incredibly important and they're disappearing. And that's really our next challenge going forward. We have to think beyond protected wilderness. And you can't do that unless you're engaging the people in those landscapes, first and foremost, in that solution. Led by the people on the ground, Western Landowners Alliance advances policies and practices that sustain working lands, connected landscapes, and native species. What we're seeing in the West today is incredibly hopeful because 
you do see collaborations, working with partners, trying to realize this vision that's so important to us. I think many places in the rural West are actually leading the way on this. And so can you. Join us and learn more at westernlandowners.org. And now back to our program. What are the climate implications of, you know, standard wetland rice growing versus dry land system of rice intensification, that the SRI system that you're doing? Yeah, very good. So, so climate. One of the things that I mentioned a little bit a little earlier is that the traditional way of growing rice with submerged water is really contributing heavily to methane gas in the atmosphere, meaning that in all of that water, when you think about 3.5 billion people on the planet, rice is their staple food. That's a lot of people. There's a lot of rice growing in Asia, in Africa, South America, in this country even. There's a lot of rice growing all over the world and being submerged in water. And all of that water, there are just, you know, gazillions of microbes that are off-gassing and they're off-gassing methane. And so rice, as well as we know about cows, is a huge contributor to methane gas in the atmosphere. The idea is to stop that, is to impact that in a positive way by having less water, although we are doing alternate water and drying as weed suppression as well. We are finding that that is working quite well where we may have the field lightly flooded for a week and then take it off at the very beginning of the season right after we plant so that the weed, and it suppresses the weeds. And so the idea is to get away from that and to create, apparently the the statistic is that it's 40% less methane in the atmosphere by growing SRI rice. And so that's that's really important. It's a real important part of what SRI is about. How is the rice that you grow through SRI different from say, Asian rices, if it is? I mean, is it a different product? Does it look or taste different? Well, we're talking about varieties. First of all, there is Asian rice, right? The, the bigger category is there's Asian rice, and then there's, there's also an African rice, right? Called Glabarima, that is, people are still trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to grow it, how to get the seeds even. So most rice, every rice that we eat in America is an Asian rice, so to speak. What we have are many, many varieties though, right? There's a ton of varieties of rice. And we are growing what we call specialty rice, fragrant rice, pigmented rice. We have black rice, we have red rice, we have a jasmine, a very fragrant jasmine rice. Some of our farmers are doing Carolina Golds, another one called Santee Gold. We are primarily focusing on those kinds of specialty rices that are not your basic rice. And then we built a mill, right? So that's the other part that we could talk about, the mill and the co-op of farmers. But with the mill, in a mill, you have the option of keeping your rice after it's milled, after it's de keeping it brown and keeping the bran on it, or taking the bran off and it's white rice and it gets polished. We will keep the bran on and keep it as brown rice because that's where the nutrients are as well. Is all your growing operation in Louisiana? No. So the way we work is that, so we have a cohort of farmers. What is in Louisiana is our home base. Our home base here in Alexandria on the Inglewood Farm where we have some acreage where we have do all the trials. This year, for the first time, we're doing production because we have a mill. But we have been working from day one with farmers that are in Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. And so we have a cohort that we work with that are all experimenting with us to grow rice in this way. And only one of the farmers in our cohort is actually a rice farmer and one in Mississippi. One other one in South Carolina, he grew rice once, but it didn't go so well. (laughs) Somebody actually cut it down thinking it was weeds. We are primarily working with black farmers throughout the Southeast on this project. And so, yeah, we here in Louisiana are just where the headquarters is located. 
So in all of these places across the southeastern United States, is rice adaptable to sort of different climate zones? I mean, what's what's the ideal kind of ecosystem and climate for rice? Yeah, rice, you know, loves heat. Rice loves heat, not too, too much heat. It depends on the on the stage that it's in and growing. But it does love heat, and so it has to be after frost and also between frost and frost. And so the south is a great temperature zone. So let's talk about the beginning of rice in America. So the history of rice in the U.S. is that when the Europeans were enslaving Africans in West Africa, they ran across farmers who, African farmers, who were growing rice in the highlands, the lowlands, the wetlands, with different sophisticated ways of growing rice. And in their minds, they were like, well, we have to feed this new world. So they intentionally targeted these rice farmers and brought them captive to South Carolina. So South Carolina in the 1700s was the capital of rice in America. And rice was the crop that built this country at that time in terms of economics. It was the biggest economic driver was rice. And then it became cotton later. That's so interesting. I bet most of our listeners don't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so South Carolina was the capital of rice, but it was treacherous. I I don't know if you've been to South Carolina or not, but it is swampy. And so it would take years just to fill in the swamps with soil, with land on the backs of enslaved people. Also, you're dealing with alligators, you're dealing with snakes, you're dealing with all that that comes with the swamps. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible job. Be that as it may, the people who were enslaved still made it happen. And South Carolina is absolutely known as the rice capital in America. After emancipation, the people who were enslaved, they left to doing this this hard, laborious work. And years later, decades later, the rice capital moved to Arkansas. So right now today, Arkansas is the rice capital in the U.S. And South Carolina is historically it. And the rice, there's a rice museum in South Carolina, in Georgetown, if anybody ever gets to go there. It was very interesting. I just went for the first time. Erica from Cornell and I went for the first time just this year in May to the museum. But yeah, so... From South Carolina to Arkansas and everywhere in between, rice began to grow and be planted. And so this southern United States is the place that is really ideal for rice cultivation. How would you say the system of rice that you are doing fits into regenerative agriculture? Do do you feel that it has a regenerative aspect? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the hard part, right? That's the hard part. We have a model soil first, and soil first means that we're really trying to build up the soil. We're really trying to build up the biology in our soil and the organic matter and and all such as that. And so, you know, through the cover crops, through the rotation, through all the less soil disturbance, um, you know, all of the different parts that are called regenerative agriculture we have employed. We went into a new part of the land that we had never been on this year, and it hadn't been used in quite a while. It hadn't been farmed, and it had been dormant, and we tried to grow a no-till system there uh, in direct seeding, and it just didn't work. The, the weeds just really took over. And so we redid it. We plowed. We literally had to buy for the first time plow. So we, we did plow that and, and tilled it, and we hope that that's the one and only time we have to do that plot. And now we've, you know, we've planted into it. But that's why the equipment that we need are no-till. We have a no-till seeder. We have a, a one that, that works on a tractor. We have one that is that just arrived that is works by hand. We are desperately in need of a no-till transplanter so that we can actually transplant into thick mulch without having to do it by hand. And just keeping, again, I mean, we are tractor-based now, and we know about compression, but we keep the furrows where the water, how we, how we irrigate, or where the wheel base are of the tractors, and we try to do as little compaction as possible. But 
yeah, we are doing all those kinds of practices and we are sharing them with all the farmers that we work with in the cohort. And so being a lot working with our cover crops and finding out the best cover crops and, and how to get that biomass that we can use. Uh, and again, less soil disturbance as possible is a real important part of, of what we're doing. So let's talk about this cohort. If I understand correctly, you've been at this, you're in the fourth season of this uh, rice farming practice. And You've built a mill and are working on a kind of vertical integration piece so that you are more independent. But tell us about how that's working. I'm sure that there must be so much sort of trial and error and learning in the process as you're going along. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are a lab. And, you know, the first year we didn't know anything. Arielle was with us and she just, you know, came from her work at Cornell and Ariel Edwards, and I came in from California, and it was just one big trial. Second year, same, pretty much we kind of had our bearings a little bit. Third year, which was last year, we really were hoping to, okay, now we have a sense of what's happening. You know, we still had varietal trials. We were trying to figure out what are the best varieties that work in the South? What are the short term, the shorter term growing, the shorter growing varieties, the longer growing varieties, the more pest resistant varieties, the more heat resistant? I mean, we went through every trial possible and we have boiled down to about four Well, we have about six main varieties that have become our favorites that we know that do well. So seem to do well across the board with most of the farmers. And so we have, like I said, it's been quite the lab. And then the idea came up to actually build a rice mill. And that was mainly with a conversation with one of our farmers when I found out the price that a farmer gets for rice. I mean, when I stepped into this, I had no idea about anything. And I was learning everything from the ground, you know. And so we found out, you know, the price of rice. And we thought, first thing out of my mouth was, oh. And then, you know, the farmer takes all the risk, as we know. And then the person who has the mill comes and picks up the rice out of the silo and mills it and and makes more than the farmer. And it was like, that does not work for me. We need to own our own mill. And from that conversation, a mill was built. (laughs) And we just, yeah, we have a mill now. We have a mill. And so the idea is that the farmers as a cohort coming together also as a cooperative, running the mill and participating in the upside, not only of, first of all, organic specialty rice, but also the upside of owning the mill and cutting out the middle person. And so we're very excited about how this will work. It's a big experiment. You know, cooperatives come and they go. And I have a vision that, and I hope we're all holding that vision, that this will be a successful co-op that can grow and grow and grow and become a, a major player in American food, in our food industry. Talk more about the cooperative aspect of it. How are the farmers in the cohort cooperating with one another? What does that look like? Well, it hasn't started yet, really. We'll know soon. We're having our first meeting in November. But what we have done thus far is we've done some Zoom calls and we've had certain farmers meet each other on Zoom. Certain farmers have met each other uh, at the farms. They've come here. We had a farm visit to another farmer, dear friend by the name of Adam Chappell. A couple of our farmers met there. So it's just been more of everybody getting ready for it and understanding. And, you know, they have each other's numbers, you know, but the farmers are busy. But like I said, we're having our first meeting in November and we'll see how it goes. You know, one of the things that there's a history of co-ops not lasting long and, you know, trust is an issue and people who have different ideas of what it should be or, or how much money they want to make versus, you know, and having self-interest and, at heart and all of that. And so one of the things that I'm doing to try to help for more success is there is a woman by the name of Shirley Sherrod. 
She and her husband, Charles Sherrod, and a group of other people started the very first land trust in America. It was a group of black people who had 6,000 acres in Georgia, and they made it a land trust, and they did a cooperatively uh, run organization. And so, and it lasted for many years before, you know, it was of so many ways being attacked by white farmers who wanted to to shut them down, and, and it finally did happen. But Shirley is a, Sherrod, Ms. Sherrod is a very good friend and colleague of ours, and she has deep experience on how the internal part works. How does the people part work of having a co-op? I'm not worried about the business part. I think the business is going to be fine. The hardest part is always the people part of any organization of a business is the people part. And so how do you keep that together? And so she's got a lot of skills in that and a lot of experience. And, and she's riding shotgun with us, with me, front and center in some of the things that she knows. And then the things that, you know, how do we stay together and know that we is stronger than me? Because I strongly believe that myself. I know that all of our boats need to be lifted together in order to really do well here in this country, particularly for black folks who have not had even close to an equal playing field, that it is really going to take us coming together and and to kind of find a way to shy away from the hyper-individualistic way that this society is, that it's based on. It's, It's definitely going to have its challenges. It's never easy. But the way it's been going hasn't been easy, you know, and very unsuccessful for so many black farmers. So it's like hopefully we will be able to be a group of people. And I know everybody. I mean, we at Jubilee Justice, we're the ones who knows every single farmer, right? And personally, I think we've got an amazing group of very, very brilliant, brilliant farmers, brilliant people, heartfelt, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. On the front of your website, it has the quotation, if you want to understand wealth and inequality in this country, you have to understand black land loss. Talk a little bit more about that. I mean, you talked about the really the decimation of black land ownership after Reconstruction and in the beginning of the 20th century. Where are we at now? Pathetic. That's where we are. We're at less than 1% of farmers are black farmers. We're at, like I said, two, you know, the, the, the acreage is two million acres or less and going down. It's a sad, sad situation. And in a country where land is wealth, imagine the wealth, the intergenerational wealth that could be in the black community, in black homes, in black, in black families, had that land not been confiscated the way that it has been so systematically confiscated by both the U.S. government and private sector, literally colluding together to take the land from from black farmers in ways that it's just pretty appalling. I mean, and, and the thing is, is that America, by and large, doesn't know this story, just like you didn't know the story about the rights. They don't know the story. I mean, I think that What happened to Mr. George Floyd in um, Minneapolis a few years ago, that the whole world saw this video that was caught on a cell phone. And it was like, oh, my God, this is really still happening yet now. And the world responded, not just our country, the world did. There are no cell phones in rural America that are taking photographs of the discrimination of the racist elements that are taking place every day. There's no cell phones capturing that. You don't see the, you're not seeing this on Instagram. And so it's pretty much under the radar. And yet it is so prevalent that it's just time for people to know about it to know what's happening in rural America. And for me, there's no other place to be than in the South, where the most harm happened in this country. 
This is where it happened everywhere. Now, don't get me wrong. I know the North would like to think that they did not participate in, in the peculiar institution of slavery, but it did and benefited very much in different ways, you know, all your insurance companies and universities and so, so forth and so on, but, and, and, slave, and slavery. But what happened in the South, what happened in the South, the chattel slavery that this country was built on, this is where the harm, this is where deep, deep traumatic harm happened. Trauma for everyone, black folks and white folks, traumatized. So for me, I don't know. I can't imagine me being anywhere else right now in, in this phase of my life doing any work towards justice. It needs to be here where the most harm happened. And it is, like I said, still happening. And a lot of it has to do with land. Land and place. You know, where people live, where they're rooted. They were taken. Land was stolen from indigenous people. Africans were taken from their land you know, forced to build land up and to create a thriving economy for other people based on land. And it's our earth. It's the planet. It's the soil. It's all the beautiful beauty of land that the juxtaposition of the horror of slavery and the beauty of land and soil and all the beautiful microorganisms that are living under this soil who are creating the plant life that we know and love and eat. And it's, yeah, you know, both of those realities are living side by side on top of the land. There's all this horror and under the land, there's just all this beauty. And I just think that land is a big piece of us as humans on the planet, how we treat the land how we treat each other. It's the same. So this dichotomy that we have between, this false dichotomy that we have between climate and justice, it's it's all the same stuff. We are the land. We are land walking and talking. We are the earth. We're all stardust, actually. You know? And it's, it's important how we treat all of it. You can't, well, you can, but it's sad when you separate and you think, well, I'm going to save the earth. And then you put that young black boy in prison behind at underage whose life was thrown away from the very beginning since he was five. He was already destined to prison and you built the prison for him knowing that, oh, that's his path. But I'm going to save the earth and the polar bears and all the other creatures. We're all in this together. This is all about regeneration. Regeneration is at the center. It's either regeneration or it's exploitation. They can't live in the same place at the same time. And exploitation is what our capitalist system is based upon. Exploiting the earth, exploiting the people, exploiting our family of other animals that we share this earth with. And until we really get that regeneration and regenerative agriculture is more than regenerative agriculture, it's not just regenerative agriculture. You can't have regenerative agriculture without a regenerative society. We have to stop the separation. Yeah, yeah. Or it'll never work. So what is your vision for the work of Jubilee Justice and the farmers who you're working with to regenerate not only land, but wealth and the process of healing with, I don't want to say after because it's still going on, but with all these decades and centuries of trauma? I feel that our healing, we can't heal forward if we don't heal backwards. We have to acknowledge what has happened here in this country, all of us, 
and including our farmers. When we go on the land, when we meet our farmers and we go on their farms and we start talking about, you know, where the land come from, how many generations back, and how did your grandfather farm, or, you know, smiles come on their face and they talk, oh, yeah, he did it naturally. They use the word natural or with this kindness in their heart, you know, and in their face around how it used to be, how it used to be. And now they're indebted to the chemical companies and caught in the web of chemicals and don't know exactly how to get out. And so that is a big issue and that is a big problem. But yet, in order for us to heal, if we can go back to our ancestors, our ancestors who, who paved the way for us to be here right now, and understand and listen to the land and listen and have a sense of community amongst each other, that whole divide and conquer strategy, getting away from that, getting to know each other, creating communities of practice together, that's what Jubilee Justice is doing, creating these communities where we come together and we get to know each other and we get to talk about the past and we get to laugh and be a part of our ancestry where even as hard as it was and as horrible as it was for our particular ancestors, there was always joy. There was always love. There was always that heart of of the people that you can never break, no matter what. And so that's what we have to focus on, and that's what we focus on. We, We focus on love, straight up. Yeah. We focus on love. Conda Mason, thank you so much for being with us here on Down to Earth. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it, and um, I wish you well. Conda Mason is co-founder and president of Jubilee Justice. You can find out more at jubileejustice.org. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impact of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.